Hey guys, what's up? You're back for another episode of Save Us You Presents Mulu Murai. Uh, weekly episode every Tuesday. I don't know, man. This this has been difficult, and you know why it's been difficult because um, scheduling has been really, really, I don't know, just just a lot for me to handle. And um, I have talked to like numerous guests, so I think there's like five, six, seven guests that's bound to happen on the show. However. You know, like MC three MCO three point oh happened, and um, they're they're tightening the SOPs and whatever. So it's 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 a lot to to have um, have it work out, especially in video form. You know, like I just think that there's a lot of people involved in the production aspect, and so you know these things might be delayed every once in a while. But I'll try to like have a bank of guests. And record it on one day, and then so we can just like publish weekly. But um, thanks to those who have been supporting us financially, and it, it does, you know I've been getting uh, donations for the past two weeks or three weeks, I think, um, for the podcast in particular. So it's nice to see that you guys are appreciative of this. And if you do want to financially support us, the donation link is somewhere in the link uh, of Safe House and STU Pod. I don't think it's gonna show up in the YouTube because <laughs> no one's gonna do it, but. Um, <laughs> It's in the link in Safe House, uh, Safe House somewhere. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was supposed to have three guests today, uh, three different shows, <laughs> and it turns out that I only have um, one. And this is due to the convenience because you guys do live within the district, um, so that of Safe House, so it it, it, <laughs> it all works out. Um, but what? Well, who I have with me today are close friends of Safe House, and they've performed here for like numerous times. Uh, it's, it's been um, like really close relationship with them as artists and them with us as a venue and a platform. Uh, but generally, we are also friends. We've been around with each other for quite a while. I think mm-hmm. during the the whenever we've been around in the scene again. Yeah. So yeah, I have with me uh, Jimmy, aka Ready Rocket, and Luna Dira. Hello. Hey. Uh, and they requested <laughs> as a condition. To them showing up to uh, this podcast today is that they requested my good friend or mm-hmm. save us partner as well. What? An artist on her, <laughs> a, on her own right. Also recurring guest, uh, Alicia. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, like as you can see, like, there's quite a lot of people right now, like four people. And it's, I don't know, it's been, I've been trying to figure out how to juggle this shit because it seems mm-hmm. like it, it, it is a lot to handle all at the same time. But uh, I already told you guys, this is a, uh, a show about what's happened, what's happening, what will happen in the Malaysia creative arts industry. And we've been together, like I said, for a while already. And I just wanted to uh, maybe like retract a bit our history. Um, with what I've experienced with you is uh, through Hoax Vision. And when we started making music and all the, every, being part of the scene, um, the other counterpart of Hoax Vision and who everybody was like looking towards was um, Akela. Mm. And I'm going to work this way chronologically okay. like, with like, how, how I like, what, you know, know of you guys and what I've seen you guys do. Um, and Akela is like a production music production collective and yeah. did like very alternative electronic beats they also hosted events and you were part of it mm-hmm. you want to talk a bit about that and what your experience with Akila maybe just say to everyone who's not aware of it because I do think that they have a very strong presence during when we started and we looked up to Akila like incredibly so our blueprint as a collective would be that and if you guys don't know what they are I think this could be like a great insight into it lah. damn okay well I um well, Akila is is we 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 started off as like a bunch of producers, just trying to learn from each other and just make music. So from there on, we kind of like see what else we can do with music. But the basis of it all, we're just a bunch of producers spending time together and make music, and just kept doing that on and on. Yeah. Um, but. I think I think mobilizing everything was like um, something that you, you didn't really see in Malaysia lah because people weren't really doing like these internet form collectives. You guys didn't really know each other beforehand. It's all from like SoundCloud and shit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, how did that form? Like, what was the basis of like, you know? And oh, who were 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Be, be like a bit descriptive <laughs> also, yeah, like, really like yeah. because like you guys weren't friends. Like you guys weren't like you know real life friends. You guys didn't really know each other. No. It's more about like developing that similar interest of making music. You see it a lot now. Mm. Everybody does it now. Um, but no, like back then, it was very rare that people like conglomerated together because of shared interests on the internet. Mm. And it wasn't that big uh yeah yeah um we had soundcloud back then yeah so what what happened was that honestly like um they started it started off with just uh so there's uh vampire myth yeah. there's uh kane um there's uh, uh yana yana we have super shell hill we had super shell hill and then we have uh nemo um Vukarinka, and there was a lot. Faris. Yeah, and FRS. Uh, Fox was never part of Akila. He was a part of um, another collective from Singapore called Phyla. Yeah. So we did work along together a lot, Phyla and Akila. So that, that's the connection between Singapore and Malaysia. KL. Yeah. So what happened was that... Um, Moose decided to do this thing called... Uh, it's like a bit cipher. Yeah, yeah. Midnight Oil guy. Yeah, Midnight Oil yeah. bit cipher. So honestly, that is when everyone started like, you know, coming together. Yeah. yeah. So that's when we started hearing everyone else's work. Mm. Yeah, that's what that's where like Shell Hill started putting out stuff. Yeah, that's where I started sampling stuff. It was my first time doing it. So that kind of brought everyone together. Yeah. Um... So for those who don't know, Midnight Oil is like a monthly, I think, mm-hmm. uh, um, beat cipher where Vampire Myth would like um, find us. Was it just him or was it like the whole group? Uh, he said off us and then I said we start rotating. Okay, so uh, what I understood is that there was a sample and then they would just be, it would just be like, okay guys, uh, all the producers that within the area who's interested, just send in whatever mix or whatever you can make out of the sample and then we'll mm-hmm. put it into like a whole cipher that lasts for like 30 minutes or something yeah. like that. And that yeah. was one of the more interesting things to happen because you just don't see that collaboration on that level um, back then. And then you can mm. see like all kinds of styles and all kinds of different... But honestly, at that time, there was a few already. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, yeah, we had Midnight Oil. Singapore had Top Cat. Uh-huh. Uh, LA had Team Supreme. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess that we were... Um, it was just something that we felt like, okay, we want to do this too. Mm. Yeah. So, it was just... Um, one of us would pick out a sample... And then we pick out a BPM. And then all the producers that decide to join in would have to sample that sample and then make something for like about a minute long track. Yeah. yeah. And then what we do is that we compile them together, mix it for them. We even master it to make sure that it sounds okay and cohesive with each other. Yeah. And then just put it out every month. I also yeah. think it was an era where like producers were, had a spotlight. Like mm. it was like people really focused on producers a lot at that time. Yeah. Yeah, because being a rapper wasn't that popular back then. Yeah, yeah right. Like mm. that. It's not like I mean, it, even in in Akila, you had Nemo, mm. and um, most, most rap. Most lah, and most it, rap was yeah, so, as, yeah. as part of Master Machine, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah so it was just those two that that like rap. Yeah. Um, and then back you guys time. collaborated with Ami Meluda. Yes. Um, but it wasn't as like glamorous as it, as it is now. Mm, yeah. I Maybe mean, yeah. it was different, man. It was I mean, yeah. Then, yeah. Like yeah. But then at the same time, back then it was kind of, it's quite fun because we had a lot of support. So ever since the Midnight All uh, project started picking up, Juice would actually put out every month, like who's in it. Yeah. Right, right. And yeah. feature all the producers that's into yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, that, that was also another exciting thing that we talk about on this podcast quite a lot is about mm. like how fun it was back then for like, <laughs> because we had all this like magazines and publications yeah. to like look forward to be part of like, um, Juice, uh, Gumball, yeah. and uh, I don't even remember all yeah. those. But there, there was a lot of blogs, there was a lot of zines and stuff. So the communities felt a little bit more in tune with each other. Mm-hmm. Kind. Yeah. You would also see a lot of each other. You would like um, like read about each other. But now that the scene has been like really evolved from that, um, you and these publications which don't make money anymore so mm. they have to like rely on these like clickbait ads I don't think you see a lot of cohesion and like community yeah. um, as much as it was then you think so as well or 
I feel like now it's just a bit different that um, there's just too this there's so much going on. I feel, you know, and saturated, saturated. Yeah, yeah. I don't blame the publication or anything. I'm just saying that. Yeah, there's a lot of people is doing a lot of things. Yeah, so, yeah. So. I mean, an- another thing is that back then not everybody was like savvy enough to download. Yeah. Ableton and yeah. then like do all this like bedroom yeah. production. Technically, it was just about you know who you surround yourself with. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but you started off as that as well, kind of like bedroom, um, bedroom pop, and you made your your own music by yourself. Uh, I mean, like the the I kind of started in that was a bit more like it was just me doing covers at home. Yeah. Um, practicing my guitar and my ukulele, but. Um, I think my introduction to the the scene is more from, like he said, I was surrounding myself with people who were from like smaller collectives in in KL or Shalom, like Rebel Fef. I did yeah. know about Hoax, uh, <laughs> Akila, and all that. But um, I guess I got my start literally from the bedroom, you know, posting yeah. it online and stuff like that. So our routes are a bit different. In that way, but I, I I was very aware of like all these collectives and the cool, yeah. what the cool kids were doing from yeah. a distance. I mean, I do, like, I'm not gonna like disregard <laughs> that, but I totally forgot to mention like I do did also know about Nadira back when before I started the hoax. Actually, I mean, I don't know if I knew you before I started the hoax, but I did start Revo Fev with um, Z uh, Z journalist, which is like my first ever like when we when I learned how to. Um, you know, organize events and stuff, and you were close friends with them. Um, but yeah, you've been always like singing and making music through through that crowd. And there was this for me having having stepped into those two worlds. Like Macham Revo Fev was more about like indie band music, and then and then when I switched over to like Hoax uh, and Akila, it was more about these like electronic sounding stuff and more. <laughs> I don't think there was trap in the beginning. Uh. I don't think it was it was trap in the beginning. Uh. Uh, it was definitely more like hip hop and hip hop and electronic. Um, mm. Trap like, evolved after a while. So it's That's interesting those combined. those two worlds together, and then like how we kind of yeah exactly yeah. how it came how it came together. I guess the common factor is that we're both underground. It's just it's yeah. different lifestyles, different aesthetics, different goals of how mm. like how we want to achieve yeah. making music. What do you guys yeah. think about the, the underground part? Like, do you still, do you think, do you think that there's really like, okay, Machen uh, Chunto, I was talking about Force Park Boys, you know them, or like, ah, oh, fuck, Titi on the Move, like these kinds of like mm-hmm. rap collectives, they're like massive, mm-hmm. um, they make trap music, but they've come to the point where they could like bridge mainstream already, but would you consider them underground? It's, I don't know. What is that distinction? Yeah. Like, a lot of people saying this shit now. You know, like, mm-hmm. there's always just, like, this underground kind of um, communities and, like, music. But at what point do you, like, draw the line? Okay, this is not underground anymore. I feel anymore. like right now we're at a point where that that gap is becoming a bit more blurry. Because, we like, from my perspective, I still kind of segregate um, mainstream and underground as, like, the mainstream is the mass Malay market or the mass Chinese market or the mass Indian market. But like for underground, it's always, everyone's kind of interconnected in, in a way. And um, yeah, as much as mm. it is way more celebrated, I feel like it is still underground because of the lack of recognition, recognition that we get from the mass media. Okay. Yeah. So that's the distinction. Uh, like yeah. whether you are like shown on. Yeah. Radio, like era. Yeah, in in the traditional sense of how Malaysia does their the in, how the industry works in Malaysia. Yeah, but yeah. what what but what do you think about much um, YouTube views and like once you reach a certain mark, don't you think that that's kind of broken you out of? Yeah, of mm. course. But when the fact that we're still in KL and the fact that we're still in Malaysia, we're still kind of playing by certain rules that were set by people that are way older than us and have been in the industry way longer than us. So. It depends on your your perspective as an artist, because I feel like there is a lot of um, discourse around the, the the topic of whether someone's mainstream or underground. But at the end of the day, it's like you can't really tell anymore because of the way yeah. that people yeah, exactly. consume yeah. music and how the internet culture has evolved in KL. I feel, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I... the perspective is also skewed because of the like internet and then yeah. identity. Yeah. Mm. So much. Um, for example, like. Most part boys were like, uh, I mean, they have like three million, I mean, 
you need a news on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But for example, like how they perceive themselves on the internet, if they were like, they perceive themselves as an underground kid and then they play yeah. like fake mm -hmm. up. Yeah. People would be like, oh, this is the underground kid made it. But they would just still see, they would still be perceived as underground. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. like three yeah. million to them is like three million of us yeah. instead yeah. of three million of Malaysia. Exactly. You know? yeah. That's that, That's what uh, I think uh, sets God apart because th even though he's doing these kinds of numbers, they're much um, very... Um, active and engaging on social media mm -hmm. so and he knows how to interact with the audience mm -hmm. in a way where it seems personal mm -hmm. enough that people don't think he's like some yeah. superstar people yeah. just think that he's, he's well, him. yeah I guess in that sense you can kind of differentiate who is mainstream or who is underground by the attitude that they show yeah. with their craft yeah. yeah you know like how they treat themselves as artists is is see what the difference is and right now I don't think you can just say it's mainstream or underground it's like what makes you an artist and what makes you just someone that's just yeah. whatever not what whoever who is not an artist is you know yeah like it depends on how you perceive it if we like retract a bit with the when you guys really started off and I don't know oh yeah you also were involved with Lost Fellas after um, <laughs> yeah. Revo Fab right yeah and then these kinds of experiences with you guys being in collectives and these in the in the underground because that back then you knew what was the underground, mm -hmm. you know it was that, that was so obvious like okay, everybody knew each other. It was more about having fun and just building mm -hmm. these kinds of communities. Mm -hmm. um, but now, um, what 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 did you guys learn from like that? Because there's you guys aren't a part of it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Akila uh, broke up, uh, as far as I know. Yeah. Lost fellas, I just. I don't know if they average it. I think... I mean, the HQ is still there, but... Um, the HQ. <laughs> well, they're, 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 they're the HQ. So basically, Lost Fellas came from the... the it's basically a name that we kind of gave our hangout spot. Um, it's not a trap house. Um, <laughs> it's a HQ. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like, what, what was the question again? What did you guys learn? I mean, oh. I mean, obviously, obviously, it was a very big... Uh, identity shaping yeah. um, part of our, our career I mean mm. yeah. you know our yeah, answers would be different because yeah. you're coming from a standpoint where you were a producer I was I came in as like the first female artist of Lost Fellas yeah. you know? I, so I think for me with The Killer it's just that I wish I didn't I would I wish that I honestly how I went through it is exactly how I wanted to right. yeah because I feel like at that age and then being surrounded yourself, surrounding yourself with this kind of people and friends is, it's not something that you get to experience a lot. So being oblivious is just the best thing to just be in that circle. Yeah. And just, yeah. So we kind of, I, I, I learned a lot about like, you know, meeting new people and just technically, basically just do whatever that we want to do. It's basically like, you know, with music and then with music, okay, what else do you need after that? You need like, like artworks or whatever yeah, and then yeah. you start meeting people and then you know that's kind of like basically focusing on one thing and then and just embark from there and see where it takes you rather than you know thinking of like oh should I do this or should I not do this so, yeah. yeah I think the biggest thing that I learned from being in, I mean just being part of Hoax and what we did together was that like really realizing oh we can actually do all, do all of this ourselves mm. like we realized okay we can make music ourselves number one artwork throw events mm. manage you know all these things that we thought oh fuck much like, susah gila um, or you need a manager or you need a label to do all these things mm. and we realized fuck you know you can like learn how to edit a video it doesn't mm. have to be like the best video yeah. but it, it's out now yeah. you know and that's, that's proof of that another thing that was like really really fun for us I think one of my most fun experiences was um, me, Naufal, Faris and Arif we kind of like locked ourselves in um, my house for like two three weeks just to make like a project and I haven't had experience like that ever mm. since then, you know, and I'm sure mm. you guys, I'm not sure that you, but I know like Akila definitely had those kinds of moments, yeah. right? Yeah. Where it's just like, okay, fuck, fuck everything <laughs> or work or whatever. And then it's just yeah, like, man. Yeah. work in, in the cave it's stuff. Yeah. The and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it's crazy yeah. how, how, how much of a building experience that is kind. Yeah. You get taken seriously, I feel you get validated from your peers when you're in a collective I feel like that's like a platform True. for you to be like hey I got my shit together I know what mm, to do right. I, I'm learning you know yeah. everyone's accountable for it yeah you know, you're not really listening to anyone's rules yeah you're and on your own. You're, you're just battling with each other you know yeah. trying to be better than each other yeah. but at the same time everyone knew who everyone else was 
Yeah. It wasn't like a I don't I don't know about like beef between collectives or anything like that, but like I mean there were. Yeah. 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 We get into that. <laughs> <laughs> huh? like, 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 I don't think I, there was I any think, beef. Like, Hale's too small for us to have beef unless yeah. it was like. No, I think it's like there were there was beef, but it's more of like we quickly realized that it's not necessary. I feel like the the reason why there are a lot of collectives is because we actually need that to kind of sustain a certain scene. Yeah. If if it wasn't for like the variety of different collectives, this scene wouldn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly people hate the hoax. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I knew that. That was a that was a popular sentiment uh, yeah. Um, yeah. among peop- among everyone. Um, but once like the younger people knew hoax, they're like okay with it. But uh, we definitely didn't get like along with the older crowd. Uh, like, I mean, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, like the older crowd that like, used to DJ at like mm. Bucky Top. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean I think what, what, okay um, uh, I feel like beef is quite healthy what Akila and I mean yeah, like, co- co- no yeah, yeah sure I think that I don't think we've ever beef la. no, that but, was then, never... but it's kind of this healthy beef it's like you know yeah yeah, it's like, yeah exactly like I said like we definitely looked up to Akila because it seemed like okay um, th- they're pushing boundaries in a way that like we don't understand like it's not about like guitar solos and shit yeah. you know we were like oh this is for me, the way I saw it was like, this is like forward, the way I described it was like fo- forward, um, forward thinking. I don't know if it was forward thinking, but something forward kind of music, you know, mm. where you don't like hold on to what music that was in the past so much. You just try to like experiment as much as possible mm. in a way that's fun also. Like you're not like b- making noise yeah. core, you know, you're making like yeah. bass music, you're making yeah. stuff that you can enjoy at the club and stuff. But I think that's what was cool about back then was that, you know, you have, all, you had all this different kind of music yeah, was going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You had the, the the noise thing going on, like tekan tekan. Yeah, and finda yeah. like uh, back yeah. then at findas, you know. It was crazy, man. And we, yeah, we had under nine with all this techno and you know, D and D, side Yeah, yeah side trance. More diverse sounds. Yeah, you, in the underground scene back then. Uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, obviously, at some point it, it, it converges. Right? It's about kitorang. Now we have safe house, and even we don't host these kinds of like mm. super experimental nights. That's also a reason. Mm. Right, because like people generally lost their interest to like explore, and uh, because there's no more like strong community of yeah. underground, like yeah. you know, we we don't show up to these kinds of things. If yeah. I throw out a noise call event, would you guys show up? <laughs> right, like where the kind of thing does where they like hit fucking a pot or something like tong tong tong. Back then, That'd I was cool. like, "Oh wow, this is fucking interesting." <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but yeah. but now I'm like, okay, so sometimes I like sometimes yeah. I like noise call, but most of the time I don't <laughs> want to. No, like, oh yeah, uh, uh, like, box, it's yeah. a festival yeah. game. Yeah, we got li- life fact. Yeah. yeah, no, it was uh, like it was at various places. Yeah, life like, fact, public like, house. Producers would come up and then they would like create like the most experimental. Yeah, shape and like like perform and then there would be like about fifty to one hundred people like attending yeah. and paying like fifty bucks for it. You know. Like we do have those kinds of communities for sure but it's just not as strong as it was before I think like Pataling Street does not seem like that underground mm. um, area anymore like there aren't really a lot of places that you can go to Life Fact pun tempat sekeluar rumah api pun tempat sepindah you know mm-hmm. I think uh, just the, in general the places where you're able to like have these kinds of experimentation are not there anymore um yeah, like like you with the pandemic and shit like that. Yeah. I don't, you know, like it's kind of like killed off all these places. So now we are like doing a lot of reminiscing, huh? <laughs> yeah. right? but that's all we can ever talk about. <laughs> yeah, we talked about it off camera. We're old. Yeah. Yeah. We're aging. Yo, I was just like talking to Timmy and Yira before we started the podcast about how, like, um, we're just like talking about like how like we were jaded. We all are actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm I don't think I'm jaded. I'm doing this. <laughs> Think we about that. About you, uh, but it's just that like, I think it's because of the pandemic and like age, and it's just that everyone feels a bit stagnant, you know? Like yeah. we want to make shit, but like everything's so saturated that you don't want to scroll shit anymore. Yeah. 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 It's like, I think, and also like, how can you really be inspired when you're like locked inside? Mm-hmm. So, like, there's so many things you can create out of like MCO or lockdown or the pandemic. So, I guess I do understand that like the other part is like building with theory, uh, but it's also quite, quite tiring. It's a weird time. I mean, music-wise, I don't think it's that weird. It's not that. It's not that weird. It's very clear-cut what what everybody listens to nowadays. Yeah. You Which know, is what? Um, trap. 
right? Really still? Yeah. No. Everyone, like, like, like I, that, that, I mean, that's one of the more exciting things to happen now, but like in general, like, like TikTok has you, made hyperpop so hot. No. We, yeah. Um, it, sure. But like in, in Malaysia, like, I mean, you know, like the mm-hmm. vast majority of people who go around this, this underground thing, you know, like mm-hmm. who can you point out and say like, okay, these are, they're like the purveyors of the underground right now. Um, mm-hmm. Platforms that do, and then publications that do, mm. um, and people generally don't want to listen to more experimental things. So I think that's already a trend of it. But would you guys tie in the term underground with sounds that are not mainstream? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, it the distinction would be um, the how how like you get like you said just now was um, if you are on mainstream media or not and mass Malay, and then everyone else is underground. So mm. if, if someone were an underground artist and they did trap, that still could be considered underground? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean... Think, I think it depends on the person. Because, like, I'm not coming from a musician standpoint, so I think it's for, for me, it's, like, the overall product. Mm. One is, like, the association with the people that you are in, and then, like, the other is, like, the actual music up. Yeah. So even, for example, you make jazz, and jazz is completely not underground, right? But the way you experiment, I don't know, Yes, it's underground. But like mm. the way you experiment with yeah. that genre. So all, yeah, underground yeah. is very contextual. Uh, yeah. yeah, at the end of the true. day. Yeah. yeah. I do think so. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what we can do that because like it, it, it like the way I think what I wanted to point out was that back then it was so obvious what it was and now it's just yeah. so yeah. blurry. Yeah. And then what what where are we in that, you know? Yeah. Like be I did hoax, and then now I do safe house, and I'm doing a fucking podcast, right? Like this is like the nerdiest I can get um, <laughs> within within this whole thing. So, yeah. and then you guys are also doing kind of like the nerdiest that you guys can do. Like considering, okay, Ready Rocket, you knew what he would, he did back then, you know, um, and then what he's doing now is just uh, something that we've as as people kind of like we grow and then we kind of like tame ourselves a little bit with the experimentation but mm. it's also because we want to be like that yeah right we want to stop with the fucking I wouldn't say I tamed myself though no. it was uh, I feel I feel saving <laughs> the best for last huh? yeah <laughs> uh, uh, yeah testing out the water now no, I mean I feel like for me my personal uh, growth as a musician and as a producer it's yeah. very like my jump okay yeah of course I start off that's one okay honestly like one thing I really bit like got to me was just that yes yes I had the whole killer thing going on and yes the, the sound was very like you know all over the place it was very experimental and things like that and I keep getting people like you know oh why don't you do that thing again you know why don't you go back to this, this kind of music again you know like sound yeah it's yeah. the kind of sound sorry yeah just because I feel like well, that my sound feels a bit like, you know, not as crazy as before. It doesn't mean oh. that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more of like, okay, I would love to tap into this different side of me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you so, haven't tried yeah. pop. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just the general upper connotation that pop is like getting mm. to like, you know, more popular. Right. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a bit. There's 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 yeah. there's that uncanny relation. Yeah. Right? But then I still feel like much. Um. There's still, there's still like this other side of pop that I would like to put out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, for sure. Like, and, and then with the things that was happening right now with hyper pop and this alt, alt mm. pop. Before all of this was art pop with Saint mm. Vincent and or FKA Twigs and stuff like that, um, is it provides a different side of what pop could be, and yeah. I do think that like experimenting with that is make obviously um, not mainstream lah because mm. if I I don't know who I talked I mean, maybe I talked to you guys yeah. I was like scrolling YouTube and then I listened to Aina Abdul. Do you know that? Yeah, it's just like the, I it seems like ten years ago kind of music It's the same style mm. ballad. It, like, because, you know, yeah. in, in minor chord and shit like that um, people and I uh, attribute that to like the mass Malay mainstream market mm. 100% so anything that people do outside of that is still experimentation it's still mm. underground you know so yeah only not because in Malaysia <laughs> by default yeah just yeah just because we're not using the same formula that the mass yeah, market yeah, yeah. is doing yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that you're like, you know, not wild as before. <laughs> <laughs> I do think like when we were younger, probably short culture attracted us most. And what mm. we wanted to do, I don't know, for me at least, or I think like coming up with experimentation is more like shock. Mm. Like something that's like 
what, how can you get the most attention at this like yeah stage. yes of course yeah, or, like, yeah thing, you know? but I yeah. think as you grow older you become like you learn more theories and then you try to like okay how do I challenge this theories mm-hmm. or like these boundaries yeah so like back then like for me in terms of design i had no theory at all i'm like it's, my yeah, canvas same. was 10880 by, by 10880 like a square <laughs> canvas and then here 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 and then how do i make this challenging book a fucking like my myself half naked picture there <laughs> you know like yeah. so thirsty i like it but like yeah. now learn how to yeah challenge that stuff. and also because yeah. we see a lot of patterns i feel like exactly. because we've been in, the, in i wouldn't say that i've been in the street for a long time huh? like i'm mm. still i feel i feel like i'm still new to it but like we see like the things that have been done and tried and tested and yeah. we've tried and tested it out and then other people are doing it but to us yeah. it's nothing new you know yeah. sometimes Betul lah. yeah so it's like i feel like it's a bit harder for us to kind of relate to yeah. things that are a bit newer now because maybe we've seen like a part of it before mm-hmm. yeah and we i mean it. obviously the reward is less rewarding nowadays yeah. lah you know mm-hmm. you like back then you're like oh fuck i'm on juice you know like this is like the yeah. best thing ever and then they send time time out sends you like a, okay this is a copy of your little paragraph <laughs> you know and then you're like fucking excited but now yeah. it's just like you know all of them <laughs> you know every single person that writes and then you're like yeah. okay of course you write about me because yeah. you're my fucking friend yeah, yeah the, the reward becomes a little bit less yeah. Yeah. Um, so you your goals are higher lah, and then you yeah. you start to like be calculated yeah. a little bit more yeah man I mean yeah as it, as when I started off as a producer there was a lot of experimenting honestly like all the the, the the weird sound that you guys hear, all the crazy stuff that you guys yeah. hear, yeah. you know, for me at least, I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, I don't think yeah. any of us knew yeah. what we were doing. It was yeah. just like, okay, turn that knob and turn this knob and push that button, and then yeah. that button, you know. Yeah. So I guess now it's more of like, okay, so what is the basis of all of this, you know, like basically like really understanding, yeah. Yeah. really understanding in depth into it. Yeah. 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 That's how I guess this Yeah, I guess we all developed now. our, you know, art, yeah. art, make creation skills. Yeah, mm. theory. Yeah. Theory yeah. 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 fucked us up, though. <laughs> <laughs> Taste as well, yeah. I feel. Yeah. yeah. Taste is really hard to change <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> With the, back then, like, I had no idea what I liked and what I didn't like also. No, because I was thinking about this, like, two years ago, I think, my safe house is open and I was drinking with Vera and Jimmy and then they were asking me what's, what's going to be hot next and I was like, DC music, hyperpop. And they were like, what, what is it? <laughs> I remember I, I tried to show you guys something and then now it's like the biggest shit yeah. ever, like, especially on TikTok. Yeah. And like, I don't know, like, uh, I think it's now we're in this time where we're anticipating trends after trends and who gets to ha- like hop on it first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So much in terms of underground, there is so much that you can still embody, but you still chase for this like validation of like like for me I think for in terms of musician what I feel is that you guys spend so much time making something the moment you release it it's dead mm. because like whether people enjoy it or people like yeah. share it and it's like really yeah. horrible though yeah. yeah it's yours until the moment you put it out yeah exactly it's not yeah. yours anymore exactly yeah. I mean with, with, with the, the I guess like you know you guys have grown as artists also and like we said, you know, have developed all these like art creation skills, but you're also aware of all the other things that make, you know, art and the product what it is in in, in the scene. Um, you can't just release without like a team and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I think you guys all realize, okay, like I said earlier, okay, maybe you can do it by yourself, mm-hmm. but that kind of like becomes training as like, you have other priorities yeah. in life. You There's also want to so do. much you can do. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so how has it been like, you know, aside from being an artist and like being involved with other people like you guys were both involved with This Way Up Records right Mm -hmm. Um, and with under the guidance of Jin Hackman would that be the best way for me to say it? Mm -hmm. Julian 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 under any guidance? Uh, Under the 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 Katia huh? Katia under the army Katia Um, yeah in, in a way in some extent I feel I'm for me because uh, I've always had Juju as my manager, mm. honestly. Right. Yeah. So, okay, um, before I had Juju as my manager, I do see myself interacting a lot more with people. Yeah, and getting myself shows, getting all, you know. <laughs> well, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like doing a lot of things by myself. <laughs> but I got to the point where I feel like my jam, I kind of need a manager. I, didn't, I don't really know why I needed one, but I feel like I should have one. So, ever since then, it was just like, I still do what I'm doing now. Yeah. And Juju will just handle everything else. 
Yeah. So I'd say that how that evolved to like this way up though, like what what would they providing as a back then this way up was a record label again. Hmm. You already said this first though. Oh true. Oh, yeah. so these, was, I mean it was more of a collective yeah. also. I think that the this sentiment was similar to Akila again. Hmm. But Somewhat, when yeah. when you joined this way up it's more as an artist. Oh well, yeah. Singer songwriter. Yeah, songwriter. Producer, yeah. yeah. Um, um, how was your experience from, this from way up? switching from Saturday Selects to this way up, having to take yourself seriously and putting yourself? Yeah, I mean, on this is this is also the the distinction, right? Like of them, underground yeah. and mainstream yeah. is that once you get signed, I mean, if you're under a label, you you're signed, um, right. supposedly, <laughs> uh, that's when you stop being underground. Really? I mean, okay. I mean, um, that's that's the alternative, lah. So when when when, no, when so. there's a lot I of think, changes. I think I used to like uh, mm-hmm. raising the bar and this way up is like really big um, and then like I got older and I realized oh actually they're, they're quite still underground yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I mean, we were just doing sounds that were a bit more accessible mm. yeah already this way up yeah this way up oh, okay. more accessible yeah 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 because yeah. Jin wanted yeah. all the pretty they're dancing <laughs> around the question <laughs> yeah, yeah dancing around the question <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay for the, the difference for me was that from Akila to SS was different and from SS to this way up was different yeah. Because from Akira, I was a producer, mostly solely just producer. And then after that, when I started doing SS, it's more of like as a DJ and mm. I make edits and remixes. It's more towards like the club community rather than the producer community. Yeah. So there was already a difference there. And then from that to uh, this way up, of course, it was different too because of, you know, now I'm singer, songwriter, artist. And honestly, I still, of course, yeah, I feel feel a bit different from time to time after every change. But the people that you're working with and everything doesn't really like direct your no the way that you um, no. operate as an artist. Because I don't know about other people, but for me, I've always had the stance of like, even as a producer, I produce what I want, and even yeah. as a DJ, I play whatever I want. And sometimes I don't get got I don't get jobs because of that. <laughs> yeah, but I I didn't really care because like. That's kind of, I don't. That's just something life. that you know. I just you know. Yeah. I play what I want. I yeah. make what I want. Mm. So when I got to this way up, it's more of like okay, you make the music that you want and you sing however you want to sing. Okay, so they yeah. were totally okay with that. I think what he's trying to say is that like un- like under Jin and Juju's Katya, we were still very much um, like we were liberate. We we had a lot of freedom to mm, express yeah. and to choose how we wanted to express. So what were they providing then? Um, as a label, like I'm just like giving the perspective of any viewers yeah. that maybe mm-hmm. want to start yeah. record labels. You know, not as artists, yeah. but like as record labels. What could they like be providing to you guys? So the interesting thing about I think our path as artists under this way up was that this way up is no longer a label. Yeah. Like um, so, right now we're under Tom Tom Asia, which is still f- with the same people, but like a bigger team. But right now it's not really a label; it's more of like a management company and a distribution company. So the difference is was that um, under This Way Up, it was more of like, um, we'll help you become the artist that you want to be as much as we can. Uh, uh, we are very limited to, you know, we had resources, a lot of budget cons- yeah. constraints, a lot of uh, resource constraints, constraints. But right now, it's more of just, I think personally, um, it's more of like, in your own time, just yeah. create whatever you want to create. Mm. And then... Um, will help you the best that we can but uh, they don't tell us like what to do they right. do give suggestions where it's like if we send demos they're like oh okay uh, is there a hook yeah. or as you know like maybe mm. like you could play it up a different way but they don't really try to constrain us in any way yeah, yeah. stuff like um, music videos though like th- oh, this right. is like I mean for me what I see in Malaysia like a lot of stumbling a big stumbling block for independent artists or like artists that just like started you know making music is that I mean, they can make a music video, mm-hmm. but the, it doesn't look like it's properly made and stuff right, like that, right, you know? Right, right, right. And from that se- sense, was um, this we are providing that service to you guys? I mean, it, it depends on, on each project. I feel like um, Jin will try his best to get sponsors to try to, like, cover right. certain costs. Okay. But um, sometimes it's grants, like, yeah. let's say, from Chindana or something like that. But um, I think a lot of the uh, the artists on This Way Up, we 
have a lot of friends in our community that will try to help us out the best way that mm. they can. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is collaboration based. Um, thankfully, like they, yeah. they see our vision and they're we're quite honored to have friends that actually believe in us. Um, but other than that, I feel like most of like if you want to talk about how we get the money to do certain like music videos and stuff yeah. like that, it depends on each project. Sometimes it's uh, sponsors, sometimes it's grants, sometimes you know it's from Jin's own pocket. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Like just thinking about it, it the long term business plan is uh, for a record label to just start up nowadays. Yeah. It's just totally difficult to be making. Yeah, I mean, like, if, yeah, if Jin mm. was in this chair right now, he'd probably tell you not to do it. Yeah, you know? mm. like it's probably killing him. Um, but because um, he has a family, he has like a yeah, yeah. people to take care of. So right now, like, um, he has been quite busy with Dong Tong in general, uh, providing services to people who want to, you know, get Dong Tong to distribute their songs and stuff like that. Yeah. So we're kind of like sitting at the back right now, just trying to work on our craft, yeah. and then hopefully soon, you know, Jin will. Uh, hear something from us. <laughs> uh, yeah. You guys think we've, we've we've come to a point where we like don't need that those kinds of services that like traditional labels offer, um, like management and 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 these like production. I mean, yeah, resources. there are a lot of ways yeah. to, to compensate with uh, the lack of that. Is your social media game? Yeah. How you network? How you yeah. go out and promote your own music? What works for you will work. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you have to follow a formula. It doesn't mean you have mm-hmm. to get signed. I think working with people around just because yeah. there's so many artists that yeah. do different things. Yeah. Like yeah. you guys Especially are now, uh, like yeah. I mean, she's designed stuff for you guys, mm. um, right? Like it's just so easy for you like to go out to find mu- people with mutual interest mm. to work on different parts of the product. Mm. Um, like Alicia is very uh, interested in like making music video artwork and eh, mu- um, cover oh, cover it. artworks yeah. um, for musicians. And it's it's this kind of collaborative nature of artists. Like she doesn't make music, but she can still do that. Why yeah. not, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and videographers like Hiren, who we initially clicked because of that. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Like obviously, I would love to be able to pay his price, mm-hmm. and his fee, <laughs> um, because making videos aren't cheap and it takes up mm-hmm. a lot of time. But if there's that mutual understanding of like let's work and create something together why not mm. and I do see that a lot and people really like stepping up their yeah. professional professionalism I think one thing I guess I could say about like being an artist and making it work to work without having to be signed under a big label is your own belief in yourself and how you want to execute take yourself seriously and actually analyze what's happening like how people are working around you and play into that like you you can't really expect something to happen just because you make music you know you have to understand how the industry works and how you collaborate with people and how to manage relationships with people that you want to create with that's a huge part in creating in the indie scene i would say an underground scene yeah Mm. i also think like honestly when you mentioned that i guess like yes networking networking does play a big part into like how we can connect and like work with each other but i think managers are also really important i mean functional managers of like knowing okay like I like to make a cover artwork but the manager or like if the artist doesn't know that I'm that kind of person then the manager should at least know that to be able yeah. to connect these things yeah. I think like the other part is like the manager's special role is also to like serve this purpose of like how can you like optimize the most out of like your experience or of your one to be this kind of artist for mm-hmm. example mm-hmm. I mean I guess it's like expecting the manager to do a lot of things like to fulfill a lot of role yeah. but I guess much of if of course, you can do it yourself if you are this like, how to say, systematic or efficient person. Mm-hmm. But if you are not and you want, you're the kind of person like I really need to just focus on my shit. And then the manager's role is to be that person to be like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Obviously, okay. So maybe if you don't need a record label, then you might still need someone mm-hmm. to manage. Yeah. yeah. But you yeah. get them, get them make looks for someone that really understand understand yeah. your yeah. craft yeah. and yeah. which means really understand. understanding you as an artist as well like what are your limitations yeah. exactly. and what can you not do that you think someone else can do for you exactly. i mean like for me um like with my clients and like the what i how i work i'm really like i have ways of how i do stuff but i still at the end of the day feel like i could benefit from a manager you know mm. like yeah. how like 
little things like communication or yeah. like getting jobs or not get like saying no. I mean, yeah. there's one thing about making art, and then there's another thing about knowing the business of everything, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and then exactly. the, the the business part is what makes you actually sustain, not yeah. your art yeah. itself, you know. Yeah. Um, people, you know, okay, you would like to say that the art speaks for itself, yeah, but no one's gonna pay for that shit if, if they don't understand yeah, it, yeah, you know. Exactly, yeah. So you have to present it in a way where you can. Yeah, that make also sense. takes understanding how what how why you're doing art as well. Like the, yeah. there's always a discourse of like, oh, you're not a pure artist if you're doing this for money. Like the, I feel like that's nah. a really old conversation that should be, you know. No one thinks like that anymore. Like, yeah, I'm not, you'd I'm not be surprised. Sure. Yeah. Um, but shout out to the managers, uh, I guess. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the, the, yeah. it's a dying breed. I do yeah. think yeah. that yeah. like I, I I like managers because. Um, they're not they're not creative most of the time <laughs> you know so they don't they don't think about these yeah. these things yeah. that like artists think about yeah. and um that really sets the priorities straight and like gives scheduling for example yeah. a lot of artists don't even wake up on time you know stuff like mm-hmm. that it's just quite quite straightforward so um managers and ANRs and all these like yeah. behind the scenes people who yeah. aren't creative they really provide a good ecosystem uh, and sure, shout yeah. out to them shout out Julian shout out Jin, Jin. <laughs> um, I think that's who I want to yeah. shout out you yeah. guys give us the balance that we need <laughs> in our life yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's really how because I don't know man right? Seb, uh, yeah we got 15 minutes yeah. uh, okay. no but I was saying I was thinking about like how you guys think like I mean yes doing everything yourself is like you can do it like when you have friends that are like around you that are creative that's fun like but I think that is also part of like what we did when we were younger and then mm-hmm. when you grow older and then you start to feel more pressure of like I need to like like either like gain some finance like money from this so you yeah. think that like okay maybe I have to scale up this music video and do it professionally it's quite difficult to like be able to like I don't know. One is that gain like connections or network with people that can, would do it for you for like I guess a cheaper rate. Mm. But n- another is like knowing how to do it yourself. Yeah. So much. Um, that's like I think the things that you can get from a record label, la. But yeah. I guess it's also like finding a record label that suits this yeah. current thinking, this generation's thinking as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. knowing like how to fulfill like your need as an artist and also the the consumers need to got. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think it's also like. Record labels should have like data analytics. People. I mean, that's the thing, you know, like you don't make that much money anyway, so yeah. they don't mm-hmm. heavily invest. I mean, in Malaysia, lah, because I'm sure, like, you know, like Singapore, for example, it, the, the case is quite different. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that note, as like artists, what do you guys expect of like the scene itself? Like, what do you, what do you wish that it's changed a little bit? Um, to, what do you want to change a little bit to really have it go your way as artists you know because I'm not so sure if you guys want to spend your whole like your career as, as just an artist ideally mm. or not but um, you are not right now right like you guys are doing other things on the side like, just mm. like we all are um, but if you were to just say okay I'm, a, I'm going to be a full time artist what mm. would you expect the scene or like the community the market to really understand so at this point, I can't gauge anything. Yeah. Hmm? At this point, I can't gauge anything. Yeah. It's just. No. I feel like yeah. they're okay. Like, kind of go off of that tangent is more of like, I feel like there is gonna be a birth of a lot of new artists after yeah. this pandemic kind of blows over. Hmm. Um, a lot of people wanting to take up space to perform to express, but in the sense of, um. I guess taking care of their artists in KL. I don't know. I w- I don't want to say that I am. I don't want to say I'm not hopeful or hopeful. It's hard for me to to kind of gauge. Like he said, is because I don't even know what's gonna happen after this. Because I see that people are appreciating artists more, especially in the younger generation. But yeah, it's a different story when you have to play by the rules of people who have mm. been governing the industry yeah. for a long time. I mean, I think at some point they're gonna go away, la. Yeah. You know, yeah. like honestly, sure. After the pandemic, yeah, I do think there's going to be a surge of creatives. Yep. Um, but I don't know if there's going to be a surge of like appreciating. Mm. The I think art. it'll be different, mm. totally different. Yeah. even if, like the things that we're talking about now. You know how <laughs> things used to be, used yeah. to work. I don't think you're gonna. You can even implement it in the future. It yeah. might maybe networking will be different in the future. Yeah. You know. I mean, after all this shit, you mean? Yeah. After yeah. whatever that we were talking yeah. about, we talked about. And I feel like yeah. in the future, it's going to be, I don't know, maybe yeah. different. Because yeah, I, I was just talking to him the other day about how, like, I don't even know if I would be excited to go out to 
to events anymore. Mm. You mm. know, because maybe it's because I'm jaded as a person. Like I feel like maybe my experience has kind of given mm. me this perspective of like, okay, I need to get my shit together. I can't mm. really be a hundred percent a dreamer all the time because I was. I used to daydream a lot. I used to, you know, um, fantasize about all the things I wanted to do as an artist. But now it's more of like, how do I sustain myself so that I can at least have that time to write a song? Mm. You know. So I feel like with that kind of perspective, it, it, I can't really give you an, an answer because it's um. It's all. It depends on, I guess, what people want after this, and I feel like self-expression is something that is yes, it is um, prioritized now. But at the same time, it's it's also you can also see people kind of doing it in a performative way, where it's yeah. like I think this is what people want me to yeah. be. You know, like uh, last episode, I did a, a solo thing where I was talking. I mean, it was very brief. I think only a couple of minutes talked about how people go to these like art installations and exhibitions and then just end up like taking pictures it's like a backdrop and Instagram yeah because they don't really understand how to interact with it yeah. as art I mean yeah. that's obviously obviously there's like another level than understanding yeah. music mm-hmm. yeah. under, understanding conceptual art it's, it takes a little bit more of like yeah. um, education but yeah. still you know if like people don't you know value it as what it is and what it should be for the artist then it could be harmful more than beneficial mm-hmm. right like mm-hmm. yeah they like your music they post an Instagram story about your song but it's not contributing to the streams which is actually what you're getting money from Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so the way that you want to help in that sense you know put it on loop yeah. Right, that's like the best way to actually actually help us Mm -hmm. um, as artists for example so yeah like the education sense of of trying to help people understand what the value is is it's. I feel like it is going to change because I feel like people are a bit more educational about where they stand now yeah. as individuals yeah. on, especially TikTok. But I don't know how that's going to translate into like the genuineness of like how we perceive value in art. Mm. Yeah. You know, for me, genuineness is really just means money. Mm. like how much people are going to end up paying for your shit, regardless, because mm. that's mm. the thing that's going to put food on your table, not. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's the story. It's also like the flickish aspect. Of yeah, it. it's like how you perceive, how you portray yourself online, or the kind of music you make, and then the people that you attract. So, for example, like if you don't attract a certain kind of thing that's hot right now, you are automatically like not listened to. For example, so artists also feel pressured to like, like change or like, yeah. like how say like um, sculpt your identity to yeah. what's what's current right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because being an artist is about being a personality you now. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So. so I think it's like behavior for not like if there's something that like could be like more open. I don't know, maybe after the pandemic. Yeah. And like that could be a thing that like people, cause like I do think that people are more open to like supporting local talents now. But it's more of like what kind of local talents, yeah. you know? True, are true. Are they like too edgy or underground, or like are they edgy or underground enough, or they mm. too mainstream? So like yeah. now we've uncovered that the line between underground mainstream is very blurred. Mm. Yeah. So at some point like underground means you shouldn't even be a thing anymore like yeah. like mm. more local stuff mm. yeah because mm. i feel like the, the term of underground term for underground is mostly like unreachable right mm. i mean it's hard to reach that's why yeah. it's underground yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At this at this time right niche, now what yeah. it's our niche but then now it's like you can access pretty much anything yeah so what is underground anymore i mean that's the thing unless you cover like the little pocket in the community that's mm. just like okay but ve- very very supportive but very very small yeah. Mm. Right, like, yeah, a bunch of noise core artists, like, bang, 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 bang. You know, and they're like fucking with each other. They yeah. pay for each other's shit yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But like, yeah. it's yeah. not happening, right? Yeah. yeah. And also so, because of the pandemic, people are trying to prioritize sustainability now. Yeah, yeah. there's 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 other more essential. Yeah. So in a way, I do feel kind of like, oh, this is such a privileged thing to worry about. You know, yeah. art. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, to me, like it's it's a big factor into culture, and if just because you don't have money, you lose culture, then a lot of countries mm. that's gone to wars and pandemics mm. and whatever hyperinflation that fucks out their economy might have destroyed their culture. But no, it's not the case. These mm. things prevail throughout time, mm. regardless. Um, because it's important you know it's like building blocks of society you guys think of it now like oh it's just a song on the radio and the internet but like when you think about Bajim you was up in and stuff like that you don't mm-hmm. think that it's like a momentary yeah. thing yeah. you think that it's set in stone of what or like a reflection of that culture and society mm-hmm. you know so I do think it's still important yeah. and it will prevail regardless uh, mm-hmm. on that note um, might have a, a 
technical ending right now <laughs> given the battery of the camera um, but we are reaching one hour anyways okay. so thanks a very lot for your time no worries uh, I enjoyed it yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. I enjoyed it I did too <laughs> I was kind of nervous coming into this yeah. I don't know what we're going to talk about <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can do recurring episodes yeah. for sure if you guys are down um, I was just telling them like if it goes well I want to have a podcast with the two of them yeah for sure <laughs> I mean it's quite it's quite straightforward everything set up yeah. but thanks for coming and sharing your insight oh, okay. uh, I'm sure a lot of people us. know you and listen to your music and you have like super fans mm. <laughs> that, that we know of and like had a crazy experience here at also so but um, yeah it provided some depth about our experiences and together mm. in the scene and uh, as creatives and artists uh, and what, what we've learned so far so thank you. That was uh, Ready Rocket and Luna Dira. Thanks for having us. This is Alicia. Um, <laughs> and you are listening to Save Us You Presents Mulu Murai. Yes. Yes. Bye. See you guys hopefully hopefully uh, next Tuesday. If you want to support Tuesday. us, all the links in the bio. Thanks very much. Ciao.